So good afternoon. I'm Karen Sims Gallagher. I'm Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education and, and I'm delighted to see all of you here today. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 36th uh, Polius Lecture. It's uh, hard to believe that um, we have had this lecture series for that long um, and I'm delighted that with the guests we have today as well as with all of you being here. Um, the Pullius Lecture has welcomed and spotlighted some of the most intriguing scholars in our field, and today's presenter is definitely adding to that list. With the introduction of the uh, firm Coursera, Daphne Kohler and her co-founder, Andrew Ng, are bringing courses from top college online, from top colleges online, free for everyone who wants to take them and sign up. These massive open online courses, or MOOCs as we're usually, we uh, have them referred to, have become one of the hottest of the hot button items in uh, higher ed. Here, and I'm going to give you a little context. Uh, here at USC, President Nikias uh, spoke just last week at his, about MOOCs at his annual State of the University speech. Could I see a show of hands of who was at that uh, speech last week? Okay, so. I'm going to give you a little highlights from that. Uh, here are some of the questions that President Nikias posed for our university in the midst of the explosion of online education alternatives. He asked, what sort of university should we be in the future? What are our uncompromising academic values? How much academic rigor should be demanded in new teaching paradigms? How will this affect the historic role of faculty? And finally, what can change and what can never change as far as USC is concerned? USC has not been one of the universities to offer a MOOC. And the president was emphatic that we won't. President Nikias went so far as to compare MOOCs to the dot-com bubble of the 1990s, when the focus on the number of users, rather on the value, was created rather than on the value that was created, was ultimately responsible for the end of that business model. In general, online education today lends itself to focus on, long, on large numbers and the accelerating debate about the worthiness of education or career outcomes. I myself have been a MOOC student, um, and I was, unfortunately, one of those MOOC non-completers. But I knew that going in, I was looking to see what the MOOC, what, what taking a MOOC was about. I've written about my experience in several opinion pieces and compared MOOCs to the Rossier's online blended program that we provide to our students. The president is incredibly proud of the stance that USC has taken on online education, and I'm equally proud that Rossier has been a pioneer in online education. We built the first online Masters of Arts in teaching from a major research university. It maintains USC's all-important standards of academic rigor, integrity, and quality. Our online curriculum is the same online as it is for the on-campus program. We use normal admission standards, and of course, we charge regular tuition fees. And our results have been impressive. Since 2009, with our first cohort, we have graduated over 1,800 new, highly qualified teachers. So these weren't teachers already. These were people who wanted to get into teaching. And 80% of those graduates in this very tough market for hiring teachers are working in education. It is worth noting, however, that President Nikias has said emphatically that USC does not and will not offer an online degree at the undergraduate level. He believes that the years between 17 and 22 form much of a student's identity and many of her lifelong affiliations and that, uh, and many of her lifelong affiliations and that face-to-face -face intellectual and creative encounters inside and outside the classroom have the deepest impact. So, you know, all th this sets the stage for what I think will be a, a really important uh, both presentation of what Coursera is as well as questions from you. I'm excited that Daphne Kohler is here because she brings a different perspective and a different set of experiences to this really intense debate. At USC, we are eager to hear and learn from divergent opinions and from disruptive ideas. 
Because ultimately, I believe, we're all working towards the same end, and that is to improve access and success for students. So welcome to USC, Daphne. I'm looking forward to your remarks and those of you in the audience in uh, asking questions. We're very grateful to the family of Earl V. Pullius for making not only this lecture series possible, but for endowing our Pullius Center for Higher Education. For those of you who don't know his name, Earl Pullius was one of the founding faculty members of USC's Department of Higher Ed in 1957. He was a prolific writer on philosophical issues in higher learning. So I'm quite sure he would relish today's topic. As Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education, this is my opportunity to broadcast the work of the Pullius Center and its co-directors, Bill Tierney and Adriana Kizar. Dr. Tierney was recently named as a fellow in the prestigious National Academy of Education, and he's also been awarded a visiting fellowship at the University of Hong Kong to contribute th to their higher ed policy studies. His team is hard at work in the online world, too. Their suite of online games called Collegeology is now providing teenagers on Facebook with a game that teaches them how to not navigate the daunting college application process. Dr. Tierney's co-director, Dr. Adriana Kizar, is a major national thought leader in the areas of higher education governance and the professoriate. In the last few months, she has become a frequent spokesperson for, in the accelerating debate around working conditions for adjunct and part-time non-tenure track faculty. I'm sure you've seen her name, and I'm sure you've read what she is talking about. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Adriana Kizar to the podium. Hello and welcome. I want to provide just a few more updates than Karen provided about the Pullia Center's activities. And just to remind you, the Pullia Center um, continues to do uh, key work in three areas, um, equity and diversity, innovation and effectiveness, and college access. So for example, in the area of innovation, some of you may not know that Darnell Cole received a grant from Covered California's Outreach and Education for uh, what's called HOME. Uh, health Outreach Through Mobile Education Project, and it's to promote awareness and inform adult students in Los Angeles County about their options to, af um, to obtain affordable health coverage. And through this novel use of technology, so to continue this theme of technology, uh, it's helping to educate students and expanding our thinking about how we can think about student retention. You know, the issue of health care um, isn't often brought into our debates about student retention. Um, in relationship to access, um, Tatiana Melgizo, who is with, uh, with us distantly on her sabbatical in Paris, has been evaluating the effectiveness of developmental math placement policies on student success in community colleges, which is a significant and huge national issue, uh, from a grant that she received from the U.S. Department of Education. And um, Karen mentioned that um, in relationship to both access and innovation, the Polius Center, in conjunction with USC's award-winning Game Innovation Lab, um, created a series of game-based college access tools that we're really proud of. The games are now employed nationwide and are engaging students um, because they capitalize on what we know uh, engages students, which is video games, um, and helps them, though, to, to think about college aspirations and teaching them complex strategies. Uh, for understanding college and the difficult financial aid processes. And next week, um, Bill Tierney and Zoe Corbin are going to be meeting with California legislators in Sacramento. And in April, they're going to convene a group of thought leaders um, from the financial aid world um, to determine how to best use digital innovation to promote college access. Um, I also want to say from all of the Pulia staff, staff, congratulations to Bill Tierney on his um, membership to the National Academy of Education, which is a great, great honor. And, uh, and for those of you um, who are not a part of it, for more information on what the center is doing, you can keep uh, up with our activities by signing online for our newsletter, The Pulse of Pulius, um, or go to our blog, the 21st Century Scholars blog. So hopefully you will keep connected to us throughout the year, but just, we just want to highlight some of the things we're doing. Um, as Karen said, our speaker today continues our collective thinking around innovation that we've been doing at the Polia Center and throughout Rossier, and we hope you enjoy this exploration of technology and its potential for higher education. Um, as Karen said, given this is the Polius lecture, 
Um, I want to remind the audience who Earl Pulius is, and it's also in page three of your program. But he, um, he was a professor emeritus of University of Southern California. Uh, but we wanted to show you a more personal side of him today. And what you'll see in there is um, Bill Tierney, um, the center director, was contacted by uh, Debbie Bernstein, um, the granddaughter of a friend and colleague of Dr. Pulius. And so we wanted to share with you what Debbie wrote. And I'm just going to uh, give you a, a, a quick quote, but they're in there for you to give you a sense of uh, who the man was who the Pulius Center is named after. So Debbie says, I was 14 and Dr. Pulius was 61 when we began our pen pal correspondence. We were friends long before as our family visited his in the adjoining acres of our hill properties outside of Hemet, California. Grandpa had been Dr. Pulius's best friend when they both worked at Pepperdine University. I was seven when Dr. Pulius and I both fell in love with the book, Rabbit Hill, and its Franciscan motto, There is Enough for All. We continued to share good books with each other. Dr. Pulius encouraged me to write letters to him, and so it went on, and I treasured his letters so much that I saved them through the following years. So we've included some of these excerpts um, so that you can see what Debbie shared more um, uh, with Dr. Pulius and understand a bit more about his legacy through a more personal connection. And now I want to uh, welcome Michael Quick to the podium, who's the Executive Vice Provost and Professor of Biological Sciences. And he's uh, responsible for advancing excellence and innovation in undergraduate curriculum, enhancing the vibrancy of undergraduate experience, and accelerating USC's progress towards greater distinction in its PhD and professional um, graduate programs, uh, and increasing USD's stature for its postdoctoral programs. So he will then be introducing our speaker. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Andrea, um, and congratulations to you and to Bill and all the great work that the center is doing. Um, it's really an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I think I should start after Karen's uh, uh, discussion of what our president said uh, the other day of, uh, I'm sure the president would uh, very much love to welcome Daphne here. Um, and uh, unfortunately can't make it, but he would probably love to engage in a, a vibrant discussion over what uh, the future is for online education. And um, while he's uh, put a few lines in the sand, I will say, he's also a very, uh, his career is marked by innovation. Um, and I think uh, in the long run, I think there would be a meeting of the minds about uh, the future of online education. Certainly there's no... Uh, difference of opinion about what we want to achieve. It's just how we're going to get there. So it is great to have Daphne here today. Um, you know, USC, I think, in some ways has been an innovator in online education, um, starting with their uh, distance education network program in the Viterbi School of Engineering 40 years ago. Um, I think things were projected on things called uh, television screens. Uh, I've, you may have heard of those. Um, and it had the first online gerontology master's program. Uh, as as all many of you in the audience know, uh, Rossier School of Education and our School of Social Work have recently been pioneers in a certain type of online education. And um, we tend to educate, we, we are about at educating 77, 8,000 students a year in online education um, across 40 countries, so we're very proud of that. It's a different model than, than what I think we're going to hear about today, but it's a vibrant model that, that we resonate with. Um, before I became a mid-level bureaucrat in the office of the provost, I was a neuroscientist, and um, it was clear in my field and very true, I think, in many fields, that advances are made not only with great ideas, but also great technology. And the really great advances are made when those two things come together. And I can remember thinking 30 years ago that wouldn't it be great if we could videotape, we used to have a thing called videotape, if we could videotape the greatest lecturers in the world, and then I could show them to my students, wouldn't that be better than me getting up there? And I wasn't so much thinking about my students, I was thinking about I wouldn't then have to lecture. <laughs> um, 
but uh, and and so I think for a while, the field of education has been one that's been ripe with both great ideas, that wasn't one of them, but great ideas and great technology. And it'll be very interesting over the next number of years to see how that all plays out. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm sure we are going to be talking about MOOCs. Um, and we've had a lot of debates at this university over MOOCs, um, a lot of spirited debates. And uh, to some, it's, it's an amazing idea and opportunity. For others, it's a four-letter word. And um, whenever these kinds of things pop up, it always, I'm always struck. Um, most of us are from California, and most of us voted for the stem cell initiative a few years ago uh, to uh, launch a bunch of resources toward the promise of stem cells and regenerative medicine. And USC has been a great recipient of a lot of our California tax dollars to support stem cell research and regenerative medicine research. And I know when that first happened that scientists got ahead of themselves and they said things like, you know, in just a few years we will be curing, we'll personalize medicine and stem cells will be curing all sorts of diseases. So now we're a few years in and people are saying, where's my cures? when we knew all along that this was going to be a long-term opportunity and a long-term uh, until we saw it pay back. But, you know, 50 years ago when we started the war on cancer, at least there, the sort of the lifespan of ideas and things seemed to happen on a decade-long um, uh, time span. And now they seem to, the news cycle seems to be, what, eight hours. And so... Um, you know, it's really great to have the person here, or one of the people here, who not only came up with the great idea that we have the technology now, that we can provide an education for everyone. Everyone. It's such a phenomenal idea, such a big idea, that not only did, do we have the person here who launched that great idea, she also saw the end of higher education as we know it. And then, and not only did she see that, she was also around for the death of MOOCs. All in about a 12 month period that we went from MOOCs being that thing that was going to change higher education forever to the backlash against MOOCs that now where are MOOCs, there's nowhere for them to go. When we all know that in the end, of course, just like the stem cell initiative, we're gonna end up in the middle, we're going to make great advances with online education in amazing ways. Um, and I think it's a, a really wonderful uh, 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 time to be a part of this amazing transformation that we're going to see. And I am really interested in seeing where this all turns out. Because, uh, you know, we have to get away from the hype of, uh, of what we've seen about MOOCs to really get in to see what are the real opportunities there. And I think, I think I'm really excited to hear about where this can take us and, and not get too caught up in, um, in uh, you know, the first steps that this great revolution is taking. So it's my pleasure to introduce Daphne Kohler. Um, she is the Rajiv Matwani Professor in the Computer Science Department at Stanford University and also a co-founder of Coursera. Um, she works in, when she's not uh, uh, working hard in, in uh, online education, she uh, uh, works in the area of machine learning and uh, probabilistic modeling, uh, and which has applications to a lot of things, including this, but uh, computer vision, systems biology, et cetera. Um, author of hundreds of refereed uh, journal articles, recipients of so many honors, I don't have time to mention them but a couple of Presidential Early Career Awards. She's a MacArthur uh, a Foundation Fellowship uh, Award winner. Um, she's a member of the National Academy of Engineering um, and, uh, and really one of the big thinkers about where online education can go. She holds a, uh, a bachelor's degree and master's degree from Hebrew University and got her PhD from Stanford University. And so it is a real pleasure to have her here. Look forward to hearing what she has to say about uh, where things are with Coursera and what the future holds. Ladies and gentlemen, please, Daphne Kohler. Thank you. Um, 
Well, um, so I'd like to um, thank um, Karen and Adriana for inviting me here, all of you for being here, and uh, Michael for what was probably the single most controversial introduction of me that I've had in the last <laughs> years of being in this uh, space. So I thought it was going to be hard to surprise me, but you succeeded, so thank you for that. Um, so uh, I'll tell you in the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so about the the MOOC revolution, and I will point out that I personally never predicted the end of higher education, nor do I believe that it's imminent upon us one way or the other. Um, but anyway, I'll tell you about the work that we've been doing for the last uh, couple years and a little bit about where I think it might go, and I'd love to then spend some time answering questions. So um, this phase of uh, what, what are called MOOCs really started in September of 2011. Um, with a grand experiment that we conducted at Stanford University where we, based on work that we'd been doing on improving teaching within Stanford, decided to take three graduate courses in computer science and offer them for anyone around the world to take for free. Um, we announced these courses in September. We expected an enrollment of a few thousand people in each one. These are pretty advanced courses, but within a matter of a few weeks, each of those courses had an enrollment of 100,000 students or more. Now, 100,000 is not a number that you often hear in higher ed, so to put that number in perspective, the largest of these courses when offered at Stanford has an enrollment of about 400 uh, people. Um, so in order to reach that same number of people by teaching within Stanford, we would have had to offer that course for 250 years. Now. You're going to hear a lot of comments about completion rates and so on, and you know, 400 and 100,000, most of them did not complete. We already heard about that in the introduction. 20,000 of these students did complete the course. 20,000 is still a really, really large number. Okay, so we'll come back to completion rates in a little bit. Um, okay, so that was, um, sorry, um, so that was in September of 2011, and it really gave us pause for thought because all of a sudden we did in fact have the technology to take an educational experience that at least part, a very large part you might say, of the educational experience that had been in those courses available only to a tiny handful of very privileged Stanford students and offer them to anyone around the world with an internet connection, regardless of their nationality, their age group, um, or their socioeconomic status. And so that opportunity was to us something that one couldn't just walk away from because the implications of that were just too significant. And we thought about different ways in which one could um, really live up to the vision that this uh, opened up and decided that the right thing to do was to um, spin this out of Stanford, create a platform, a technology that allowed multiple top universities to take their content, their courses, and offer it up for people around the world to take for free. So we started operating in January of 2012. Uh, we launched in April 2012. We had, at that point, four university partners, what you might call the early adopters, um, Stanford, Princeton, Penn, and Michigan. Um, we had 37 courses and 200,000 legacy students left over from those Stanford courses back in the fall of 2011. Fast forward somewhat less than two years, 22 months um, from April 2012, and this is a screenshot from this morning. We have 6.6 um, .6 million students from every single country around the world. We have 14 students in Antarctica. I didn't realize anybody lived in Antarctica <laughs> besides penguins. Um, we have uh, 618 courses from 108 different partners. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of those numbers um, and then delve more into the technology and the pedagogy. So this is a, uh, this is a collection of logos from the university partners that are offering courses on Coursera. The USC logo obviously absent from that picture, as we have been uh, told. Um, 
The top left are the US-based universities that are offering courses on the platform. And you can see some of this country's finest public and private institutions. So in addition to the four founding partners who I've already mentioned, we have courses from Yale, Columbia, Chicago, and Duke, but also from the University of Washington, University of Illinois, Georgia Tech, um, University of Minnesota, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I mean, you take your pick. Uh, most institutions that you will have heard of are actually on that list. Um, the bottom right are the non-US based institutions that are offering courses. We started out as a US based effort, but very quickly went international. Um, we now have considerably more non-US than US based universities offering courses, including top universities from I think more than 16 different countries at this point. Um, top, the, the top universities from France, the top universities from Germany, Switzerland, um, Australia, Canada, China, Singapore, Taiwan, and so on and so forth, and uh, Russia, um, and therefore now able to offer courses taught natively in something like eight different languages. This is in addition to the translated subtitles that exist on the videos into yet more languages. And so this really now is um, offering students a very broad and very um, diverse educational experience that is not just a US-based education, but rather education from across the spectrum of different perspectives that you would get from a university in say Hong Kong versus one in, um, versus one in, in Switzerland. So that's the universities. Um, talking very briefly about the courses, and I'll give more examples of courses as we get into the technology and the pedagogy. Um, we started out doing computer science, but um, this is a not very up-to-date uh, example of the diversity of courses that we are currently able to offer. Currently, actually, the single largest category on the platform are courses in the humanities. Um, there's a lot of courses in the humanities. Um, there's a lot of courses in education. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, obviously some information technology, a whole range of STEM disciplines, um, business, medicine, and so on. The courses really range from something that you might even call pre-college. So we have courses in remedial writing and remedial algebra. Um, and we have all the way through core undergraduate courses up until courses in the professional disciplines such as business and medicine. So it really spans the range from pre-college all the way to the professional level. Um, so um, one category that I think is particularly interesting in the context here is the category of teacher training that we put in place in May of 2013. Um, this was put in place as part of uh, living up to our mission because we keep getting asked or kept getting asked um, what I think is a very important question, which is, it's great that we're making a dent in providing high quality higher education to people around the world, but in most parts of the world, including unfortunately here in the United States, the problems in education begin a lot earlier than higher ed. They begin in primary and secondary education. And so what are you doing about fixing those problems? And unfortunately, or what, or unfortunately, or as the case may be, we don't think that the current platform that we have is the right one for teaching a five-year-old how to sit still and pay attention or a seven-year-old how to read. That's not the right user experience. And furthermore, we believe that for that, you really do need a teacher. Um, and so one of the things that we decided to do instead is to just help make teachers better teachers. And so we put in place a category of teacher professional development. Um, currently, there's about over 40 courses in that category from institutions that range from the schools of ed of our partner universities like, um, like Rice and Michigan and, um, and others, as well as from special purpose schools of ed like Relay and New Teacher Center and so on, as well as from organizations that are not traditional um, teacher trainers but um, do a lot of it anyway, like Top Museum, like the Museum of Modern Art, or the Exploratorium, as well as the Commonwealth Education Trust in the UK, which specifically offers a curriculum aimed at teachers in the developing world with the goal of dealing with a two million teacher shortage that exists in those parts of the world that are needed in order to achieve the Millennium Development Goals by 2015 of having every child of school age in school. So um, those are some of the, um, so that's an interesting category, and I'll give a few examples from that a little bit later as well. 
The last thing I'd like to talk about is the students. And I think that's the place where I'm going to spend the most time in this part of the talk because this is the thing that really makes this important. This is why we do this. And every week we have an all hands meeting at the company and every week we read a student story. And so I'm going to give you a sampling of some of those student stories and there's dozens more. I could stand here for an hour and do this. This is Amanda who wrote us an email saying, Coursera makes studying easier for me. Um, Amanda's from Dominica. Um, I could sit at home and learn like I'm at school, no distractions, just me, my headphones and my books. I could earn certificates without spending a dime to get to my local school. It helps me a lot since my mom is in the hospital and financially I cannot afford to attend school. So that's one example. Um, Arti from India wrote us that I was devastated as I had left my job and was finding new directions in life. I wanted to go back to academics and could not find a way to do so. One of my friends recommended Coursera and it was like a new life to me. I was thrilled to see so many courses and so many ways of learning. Thanks to Coursera, I got admission into one of the premier schools in my country. She actually went to an IIT, which is one of the top um, schools of engineering in India, and I could continue my academics. Jose from the Philippines, this is more of an employability story. Um, I took the class on experimental genome science, one of the University of Pennsylvania classes. The course was very, very challenging. I had to do some of the coursework during lunch at work. There's a different kind of commitment needed in taking online courses, a stronger sense of personal integrity required. I got an interview for a job I really desire and I mentioned that I was taking the course. Now I have a new job evaluating genomic research proposals. Funny how that works. This one is very different. It was entitled, it was on one of our discussion forums in the social psychology class and it was entitled Coursera Saved My Life. Um, and I'm just gonna read it. Um, two years ago, I felt incredibly miserable. I'm coming from a traditional family, so I married young, and all my life I was either pregnant, breastfeeding, or both. I knew that I'm talented, but all I had in life was cleaning, feeding, cleaning, feeding, working part-time. I wanted very much to study like my classmates, but it was very hard to find time. I started and left, started and left. I was deeply depressed, and there was a moment when I tried to kill myself. But we humans are very tenacious of life, and I survived. At that time, I found Coursera, my first course called Game Theory, um, a Stanford course. Expelled the depression and the desire to die once and forever. I feel happy and I enjoy my life and my family much more. In the last two years, I've taken about 40 courses. I am addicted. Coursera breathes life into me. It gave me hope and I know that when my kids will grow up in 10 to 15 years, I will leave everything and go to Oxford. I dream about it. She has a picture, she goes on to say she has a picture of Oxford under her pillow in her bed. Um, and she goes on to say, as Charles Dickens once said, suffering has been stronger than all other teaching. I've been bent and broken, but I hope into a better shape. The last one that I'm gonna show you is completely different yet. Um, this is Daniel. He's a 17 year old boy, I think he's 18 by now, um, who's severely autistic. He has a speaking vocabulary of about 150 words. Um, he communicates by typing on an iPad um, and by doing so was the star student in the University of Pennsylvania Modern Contemporary American Poetry class, one that's considered challenging even by Penn standards. He has since successfully completed a number of other classes. Uh, you can see the certificates proudly displayed on the wall of his room. And he tells us, as does his father, that this is not only allowing him to learn in ways that he otherwise would not have been able to after a life of meaningless educational experiences in special ed, but this is also actually helping to diminish the severity of his disease. This is a completely different kind of access and we get a number of different stories along these lines from very, very different perspectives. Just um, in November, I was at a conference and a woman walked up to me later saying that she works with veterans that came back from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan who have post-traumatic stress disorder and can't really face the experience of going into a college classroom and sitting there. And for them, this is a step back into the educational process that will hopefully lead them back into college, but right now they can't really do that. And so there's a whole number of people who tell us that for them this is the only type of access to education that they have um, because of various disabilities, learning disabilities, cognitive disabilities, emotional or physical. And so this is yet another access that this type of technology allows. So with that, remembering that this is why we do this, I'm now going to tell you what we do. 
Um, and so I'm going to tell you what the student experience look like, looks like in, um, in these courses. So the first part of it is that we wanted to make these students feel like they were part of a college class. This is not just a bunch of open courseware that sits there and you can sort of dip in and out. This is a real class. And so it begins on a given day. And every week, just like in college, there's work you're supposed to do. And every week, there's homework that you're supposed to submit. And the homework is graded. And if you don't do your homework, you don't pass the course. And it turns out that that very simple intervention has a significant effect on student behavior. So you can see here the x-axis is time, y-axis is the number of students on the site on a given day. And you can see that heartbeat pattern. You know what that heartbeat pattern is? Every week, the day before the deadline. <laughs> Every week. Okay, so I guess demonstrating that procrastination really is a global phenomenon. <laughs> And then at the end of the game, for those students who successfully do submit all the homeworks, there is a credential. I'll talk a little bit later on about what that means um, and what it does for students. So now let's talk about some of the different pieces of the student experience. So the first is students want to feel like they're in a classroom, that they're learning from someone like a real live human. So this is not just a bunch of text on the screen. This is a real learning experience. And this is what it looks like. I'm hoping the videos work, so let's hope. Um, oh, there's no sound. Um, okay, never mind. So you can see the instructor talking, and you can see that there's different subtitles in different languages, and you can speed up the video or slow it down. So if you're a non-native English speaker, you might play it at 0 0.8 times speed, and if you are getting the material quickly or if the instructor talks really, really slowly, we all remember somebody like that from school, right? Um, you can speed it up to 2x, um, which is, by the way, the typical speed. Um, okay. Now, you saw one example of a format, but there's dozens of formats. And one of the things that we've really found is that by providing, by removing faculty from the constraints of teaching within a physical classroom, it allows them to get really creative in how they exploit their teaching environment or how they create their teaching environment. And so there's dozens of examples that I could use. Here's one. This is an introduction to sustainability course from the University of Illinois, where they shot a good fraction of their videos literally in the field to demonstrate sustainability issues. Um, on the right is a Princeton introduction to sociology class, where in addition to the weekly lecture videos, the instructor had a weekly Google Hangout session with 10 students selected from different countries around the world. And as we'll discuss um, later on, um, this really provides students with a tremendously unique perspective because sociology, like many other disciplines, is such a contextualized field that you're going to get a very different perspective from somebody in Beijing versus somebody in Abuja, Nigeria. And he said that he learned more from teaching his course to a global audience once than he did from 12 years teaching at Princeton simply because of the diversity of perspectives that he was exposed to as an instructor that in turn went back into his own classroom and helped then provide additional um, input and, and ideas to the, to the students on the Princeton campus. <clears throat> OK. Um, now, we all know that lectures can get really boring if you just sit and listen to them, although we chunk the videos into relatively small sections of you know, six to 10 minutes. But even so, we want them to be interactive. And so what you see here is that even the, those short videos include an interactive component within them. So this is an example of that. Um, so Professor Scott Page from University of Michigan, teaching model thinking. He's talking, writing on the slides. This is a fairly standard format. Video hits the yellow notch. The students get asked a question. Every student answers that question, are told immediately whether they're right or wrong, and have a chance to try again. Now, this is the kind of question that, as instructors, we might ask in our on-campus class. But at least if you're teaching a large lecture class and you're asking that class of your audience, what typically happens is that 80% of the students are still scribbling the last thing you said. And then there's that smarty pants in the front row, always the same guy, who answers the question before anyone else has even realized that a question had been asked. And then the class moves on. Here, every single student engages with the material in a much more active way, providing a better learning experience. Now, of course, uh, so sorry, so that is one way in which one can use those what we call in-video in quizzes or IVQs, but it's not the only way. So this is uh, Dan Ariely, a very famous social psychologist from Duke University, who uses these in-video quizzes in a totally different way. He uses them to survey his students 
And then when the students answer the survey question, they get told the distribution of answers that their classmates gave, kind of like you would have in a clicker uh, scenario in a classroom, only much, much larger scale. So that's another way of using it. Other instructors use this to point to outside demos, for example, and various other things that really introduce interaction into the lecture videos themselves. Now, of course, the meaningful learning doesn't happen in the lectures or even in those little baby quizzes. It happens more in the actual homeworks where the students actively need to deal with the material. But that, of course, poses a challenge because how do you grade the work of 100,000 students when you, have, when you don't have 5,000 teaching assistants? And so we've put in place two solutions to that, each of which has its own interesting um, consequences. So the first is computer-based grading. And it turns out that computers are actually now pretty good at grading a much broader range of work than just the multiple choice that you see at the top left. There's a short answer questions that we saw in the video. Um, you can grade uh, math expressions based on semantic content, not just on syntactic identity. Um, you can also grade anything that has a structured form, be it a computer program, a computer model, or an Excel spreadsheet. So you can do pretty deep stuff in the context of computer-based grading. Here is one way in which our instructors have used that incredibly creatively. This is Professor Mike Schatz from Georgia Tech, who teaches a course called Introductory Physics One with Laboratory. So you're probably sitting there scratching your head saying, how do you do a physics lab class when your students are in Nigeria and Ghana and Bangladesh and don't have access to a lab? So Mike, being a really creative guy, did the following. He said to the students, you do the experiment using materials that are found in your own environments, balls, tables, whatever. But then how do you grade it? So Mike had the students record the video using, record the experiment using their cell phone. You can see the cell phone down at the bottom there. And then in order to assess whether the students' calculations and measurements are correct, he developed this sophisticated tracking software that tracks the ball as it moves inside the video so that he can then compute things like velocities and accelerations and evaluate whether the student performed the experiment correctly. So this is an interesting experiment not just because it's a really creative use of the technology, but also because Mike was actually visiting our offices at Coursera just a, a, week, a couple weeks ago and told us about the impact that this had on his Georgia Tech teaching. Turns out that students much prefer to do experiments in the wild than they do to do them in the lab. And so now all of his Georgia Tech students are doing the experiments this way. And then having done the experiment without ever setting foot in the lab, they come into class and he doesn't lecture at them anymore. And we'll come back to that later on also. What he does is he divides them into small groups and each student presents the experiment that he did or she did, talking about you know, the different parameters and how they constructed it and so on. And five other students in the group rate different parts of the experiment as part of a, a you know, blended learning discussion. So it creates a much more active learning format that engages the students much more deeply than just sitting there listening to him lecture about physics. So this is an interesting perspective and is actually fairly common in that the online teaching experiment experience really changes the way in which instructors teach their on campus class, regardless of whether they end up using the materials of the online course in their on class, in their on campus class or not. It just completely changes your perspective. Um, there's various other things that you can do now in this online format that you couldn't do before. So for example, you can gamify things to motivate students via things like leaderboards and other mechanisms. And this is from a Melbourne class um, and, um, and so on. Now, one of the unexpected side benefits of um, auto-graded assessments is the immediacy of the feedback and the opportunity to try again. This is something that in most traditional grading schemes you don't get because by the time you, get, you learn the material, get the homework, submit the homework, get the graded homework back, three weeks have elapsed. You certainly don't get the opportunity to try again because nobody has the, the time to regrade your work um, in general. Um, and so you never really learn the material if you didn't get it right the first time. Here, because it happens, um, because the feedback is immediate and can be done at scale, students try to start to treat this as a game. And you can see that in this graph over here. Um, X-axis is how far away the student is from achieving a perfect score. And Y-axis is how likely they are to submit the assignment again when given the opportunity. And you can see the further away they are from being right, the more likely they are to resubmit. So that's all great because that's the behavior you'd like to encourage. Now, of course, the question is, 
fine, you let them submit the assignment again, they might do better on this assignment, do they actually learn better? And so we did analytics on 29 of these courses that allow what we call this mastery-based um, learning. And it turns out, and I can talk about these analytics in much greater depth if people are interested, is that students who engage in this learning don't just do better on the assignment, they also do better on the final assessment at the end, on the, um, um, on the exam. So this actually gives rise to better learning outcomes. Now, of course, um, this doesn't, uh, the auto grading only gets you so far. There's a whole wealth of assignments that currently computers can't grade. Um, Open-ended written work, designs, musical compositions, all sorts of things that computers can't deal with. So how do you do at scale grading for that open-ended type of work? So for that, we put in place um, a mechanism called peer grading, which combines ideas from the notion of calibrated peer review, which was invented down the corner here at UCLA, um, combined with ideas from crowdsourcing, which is what makes uh, Wikipedia and similar sites work. And what it does is a student um, is, submits their work and are then given a, um, a set of criteria, a grading rubric designed by the instructor. That grading rubric tells them how to evaluate the work of their peers. Um, they apply that rubric to the work of five of their peers, giving them both a numerical set of scores as well as qualitative feedback. Um, and then are, in many cases, asked by the instructor to also use the same rubric in assessing their own work. So they do a self-assessment phase. So a number of interesting things about this. First, like auto grading, this turns out to be an intervention that doesn't just have scalability benefits, it also has pedagogical benefits. Students tell us that they learn more from learning how to critically assess the work of others, in many cases than they do from doing their own work. And having to go back and think about their own work in that light, having seen some examples, and figure out what they did well and where they could have done better is a tremendously valuable learning experience to them as well. Um, here's another example of this. This is actually from the MoMA um, teacher training uh, curriculum and teaching the arts. And you can see that basically at this point, the deliverable, the student ass assignment is, this is a teacher submitting a lesson plan that is then assessed by other teachers, creating effectively a community of practice among teachers in an online format. Okay, so does peer grading work? Um, the answer is if the grading rubric is carefully designed, it works really well. So here is an, uh, a set of results from a sociology final exam from Princeton University. Um, the final exams, three essay questions, were also graded separately by TAs. And what you see here, x-axis is the TA score, y-axis is the peer grading score. Very strong correlation between them. Um, one that I would argue is probably commensurate with what we would get with two TAs grading the same piece of work. And so, if you design the grading rubric well, you can get results like this. Now, does this apply to every single type of open-ended work? No, of course not. For example, if your submission is a 10,000 word essay, chances are you're not gonna be able to find students willing to sit through it and give you the kind of detailed feedback that you would get from an expert. Same thing if it's a five page mathematical derivation in quantum physics. So not a, you know, not a full solution, to the assessment at scale problem it gets you fairly long ways. I'll show some examples in a bit. Here's one such example. This is a design course from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton Business School. It's an eight week project course. Um, the students started with a concept, moved to a prototype, eventually submitted an actual design of an art, an actual artifact. Each week they got feedback from five of their peers and the instructor tells us that he got projects in this class that are as good as anything that he's gotten in his years of teaching at Wharton. Um, so you can really do at scale work in courses that you wouldn't think that would be possible. So I'll give you one, of, one final example of this. This is one of my favorites. Um, it's my favorite for multiple reasons. Um, this is the social psychology class that I mentioned earlier in the context of one of the student stories. The instructor is um, a Professor Scott Plaus from Wesleyan University. Wesleyan is a small liberal arts college, so Scott typically teaches, I don't know, 12, 15 people in his on-campus class. His online class called um, Social Psychology had, is the single largest MOOC ever taught. It had 250,000 students enrolled. Now, Scott's final project in the class, graded via peer grading, was called the Day of Compassion. 
The students had to live 24 hours of their life in a compassionate way, analyze it using tools of social psychology, and write up their experiences, graded via peer grading. Thousands of people submitted the final assignment. 700 got a perfect score from their peers on the assignment, 700. The best one of those that was ultimately ranked by students in the class um, got a, an all expense paid trip to Stanford to meet the Dalai Lama. Now, um, in addition, so I'm gonna tell you about this final project, but as I tell you about it, I'm going to ask you to keep in mind that this was one of 700 projects that got a perfect score among several thousand that did really well but maybe didn't get a perfect score, one project. This is a physician from India um, called Balish Jindal who decided she wanted to do something about the problem of sexual violence in India. So she went to a school that has 2,000 girls from low-income families and took them together in groups and talked to them about appropriate and inappropriate touching and so on and so forth, discovered dozens of cases of sexual abuse by neighbors, teachers, family members, and so on took those girls that she discovered and is now giving them pro bono consulting on a weekly basis in her clinic together with her mothers. And doing the same for several other schools in her area. So think of the multiplier effect. Scott, if he hadn't taught the MOOC, would have continued to teach 12 students in his on-campus class to the indefinite future. Several hundred people did projects of this type, each of which might have touched the lives of thousands of people. So this is actually, I think, a really exciting I, a demonstration of the power of education. So this really, I think, lends, leads naturally to the final piece of the student experience here, which is that of community. One of the things that differentiates this experience from many previous generations of online courses is that the students aren't just sitting there doing the course on their own with the computer. There is a real sense of community that develops in the students in the class. And partly develops in the discussion forums where students ask questions and other students answer those questions. And it turns out that students answer each other's questions often far more rapidly and more effectively than an instructor would because there's more of them and there's, they have more bandwidth and they care. And so there's a really exciting um, uh, sense of energy that occurs in these forums. Um, they also, in some of the courses, we, the instructors deliberately generate a vibrant discussion around submitted students' assignments. So the assignments are posted on the form together with their peer grades, and then there's a discussion that emerges around different pieces of work just in terms of people responding to the comments and the discussion on the form. So here's one such example from the poetry class at Penn. Um, now, coming back to the point that I made earlier in the sociology class, this is a really global community, students from every single country around the world, where for so many courses, that broad perspective gives students a really unique um, a view of, um, of how, how the topic that they're studying is viewed by different cultures around the world. So actually, just this morning, Tom Friedman wrote up in the New York Times, I don't know how many, how many of you saw Tom's article this morning? Tom Friedman wrote an article about a MOOC being offered by an Arab-Israeli professor at the Technion University in Arabic, where most of the students are coming from countries that are officially in a state of war with Israel. So illustrating another way in which the global community can really sort of tear down boundaries, if you will, between different people and different cultures. Now, communities occur not just in the virtual way, place, they also occur physically. So students have naturally, um, organically created these small communities, study groups, that meet up in thousands of different uh, meetups around the world. And you can see this is a map for some point in time. It's grown, grown considerably since then. I'm gonna highlight one such example of a community. Um, this is a group in Ohio. I mean, this one is special because it really inspired us. Um, this is a group in Ohio of people who are not among life's most fortunate. It's a very poor part of Ohio. These are women primarily in their 50s and 60s, not very well educated. Uh, only one of them has a college degree. Um, all of them are either unemployed or working in low paying jobs. Got together under the supervision of Sharon Watkins, you can see her at the top left, um, and decided together that they were going to take a class. They picked a class from the Darden Business School at the University of Virginia, top 10 in the United States. And um, they took it together. 10 of them started the class. Nine of them completed it, and six of them passed an MBA-level final exam. 
two of whom ultimately went on to get jobs on the strength of having taken this class successfully. So the statistics here, I think, are a testament to the power of good online content combined with the support and scaffolding that you get from a face-to-face -face community. So inspired by that, we decided to scale this out because we believe in scale. And so um, in um, late October, in partnership with the State Department as well as a number of other organizations around the world, we created a network of what's called learning hubs. Um, <clears throat> learning hubs, there were 30 to be announced. There's going to be hundreds more. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, are um, people who come together and meet under the supervision of a facilitator to take a course together. They meet once a week, they go through the material, they talk to each other and so on, they do the class. At the US embassies, the facilitator is either an embassy official or a returning Fulbright scholar. But in other places, it could be a retired high school teacher. And the important thing is it doesn't have to be an expert in the discipline because the course is self-contained. So this is a network that's, that, as I said, we announced this in October. Just a couple weeks ago, we came back from Mexico where we announced a partnership with the Carlos Slim Foundation. Carlos Slim is the world's second, large, second richest man. And he has a network of 3,600 digital libraries in Mexico and the Spanish-speaking world. And his goal is to achieve 50% penetration of learning hubs into those digital libraries as a way of providing people who normally wouldn't have internet access and so on, access to both the technology and to a facilitator. And so this is a way of really bringing blended learning at scale to people around the world. The final piece I'd like to talk about is um, the credential at the end. So um, in January of 2013, just about a year ago, we announced um, this notion called the signature track, which is a way of earning a verified credential via the, this MOOC experience. It's not for credit. It very explicitly says somewhere over there, if you read the fine print, that it's not for credit. Um, but for many of the students on our platform, that's totally fine because the vast majority of them are not college degree seekers. Many of them have a college education of some kind or another, and they're never going to go back to school. They're working adults. Um, and so for them, this is a credential that's worth something in the marketplace in terms of employability. Um, and, um, and so this is a way for us to provide them with value. Now, this is, there's a couple of other interesting points about these credentials. First of all, you wonder what does verified credential mean in the context of an online platform. And so what we do here is actually a, um, we leverage technology to, to verify that the student is who they say they are. And the way this works is they submit a picture ID, which is compared to a webcam photo. And at the same time that they do that, they submit a biometric profile, which you can think of it as a digital signature. And the digital signature using type, uses typing patterns, because it turns out that typing patterns are really hard to forge. You can't type like somebody else, okay? even if you really try. And so, um, and so this is a way for us to then confirm every time they log on that they are who they say they are, and they're doing the work. And so that allows us to provide them with this verified certificate. So that's one interesting observation about this. The other observation about this that's important is that this is a sustainability mechanism for us. That is, the courses are free. This is a, costs a small amount, about $50 is, is average. Although there is a financial aid program for students who need it but can't afford it. Now, that $50 is what allows us to, by providing students with a real tangible value, one that can get them potentially into a better job, we get some of that value back as revenue that allows us to continue to offer free education to everyone. And it's completely optional. Now, the signature track certificate is also, a mecha is also an interesting perspective, provides us with an interesting perspective into one of the most common criticism that's levied against MOOCs. It's like, these MOOCs are terrible. Only 5% of people who sign up for a MOOC complete the MOOC. Well, you know, Karen's one of these people. I'm one of these people. I sign into, I, I, I enroll in these to know what they're about, but I never have an intent to complete them. And so that's true for many people. Many people are just signing up because they can, it's free, it's easy, and they just want to figure out what it's this about. Now, the signature track gives us a mechanism for identifying a subpopulation that is more likely to actually have intent to complete. So if you look at that, indeed, 5% of the people overall who sign up for a MOOC complete a MOOC. 63% of the people on signature track complete a MOOC. Now, furthermore, if you survey students at that point and ask them, how committed are you to completing the course? I mean, are you really planning to do all the videos and all the homeworks and so on? 
Among the highly committed population, 64% actually complete the course, and 88% of the ones on signature trap. Now, 88% is high for any online activity, even social games, far less something that requires five to seven hours of homework every week. So these are completion rates that I think are actually quite respectable once you understand that completion rates should be viewed in the light of student intent, which are very diverse, much more so than people who sign up for one of your college classes. So the last piece of this talk is about improving learning. And there's two ways in which we can improve learning. One is in the online format and one is in the face-to-face. -face. So in the online format, first of all, is the fact that you can get incredible visibility into your student's learning experience. Unlike in a traditional face-to-face -face class where you get insight into how your students are doing in the midterm and the final, here you track every single event. You know when the students pause a video, fast forward, submit a quiz, look at a forum post, it's all tracked. And so with that, you can now start getting real insights into what in your class is working and what's not. And so here's one uh, example of many that you could use this for. This is a distribution of wrong answers in one quiz question. Each little cross is a one-off wrong answer. The big crosses, like the one in the top left, is where 2,000 students made the exact same mistake in an infinite space. Now, if two students in a class of 100 make the same mistakes, you never notice. But when it's 2,000, it kind of jumps out. And so the TAs went. They looked at this. Um, the instructor and the TAs went, looked at this, figured out what was going on. And now, every time a student's answer falls into that bucket, they don't just get a sorry, you're wrong. They also get a, and you might want to think about it this way, providing them effectively with personalized feedback. So this is the use of big data for personalization. Bloom pointed out that every single one of those interventions gave rise to a standard deviation improvement in performance over the previous one. So to highlight what, that, what the implications of that are, um, Bloom said, let's imagine that we take the midpoint, the median of the lecture distribution as a performance threshold. So that half the students in that uh, distribution are going to be above that threshold and half are going to be below. What happens if you take that same threshold and apply it to the green population, the individual tutoring? 98% of the students are going to be above that threshold. Now, this gives you some, somewhat of a Lake Wobegon kind of uh, situation where 98% of your students are above average. So that would be really cool, except as Bloom points out, we cannot afford as a society to provide an individual tutor for every student, which is why he calls this the two sigma problem. But maybe we can afford to give them a tablet or smartphone. And then it gives us the question, not of whether you can achieve those results using human tutoring, but whether you can use computers to move us from the blue curve to the red curve and ultimately the green curve. So we've already talked about mastery in the online format and how, it, how by allowing students to submit and resubmit, you can get close to that. The personalization of a human tutor, of course, is much further out of reach, and we're not close to achieving that level of, uh, of uh, efficacy yet. But I think the idea of using big data in that context is a really intriguing direction for us to think about as researchers. The last place where we can improve, the second place where we can improve um, education is in physical classrooms. One of my favorite quotes in this space is one by 19th century educator Edwin Slauson, who said that college is a place where professors' lecture notes go straight to the students' lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> now, not a very charitable view, but when you look at this picture, you kind of wonder about whether maybe that's not an unreasonable perspective. And so what can we do differently? Well, what we can do differently, not an idea that I invented, is blended learning, the best of both worlds. Take really awesome online content that teaches, that allows the students to learn the basic content and the basic skills, and then have them come to class not to get that content poured into their brain, but rather to do active learning, problem solving, debate skills, convincing the guy next to you that, that your solution is better than his or hers, and so on and so forth. Or conversely, to identify using analytics the students who need the extra help and give them personal attention. So that's another thing that one, this is a way in which we can change the way we can leverage technology to change the educational experience that we provide to on-campus students. So it turns out that this is very challenging for the instructor, but also very enjoyable. 
So here are some of the instructors that have used this content to flip their classrooms. Coursera instructors have used this content. I'm not going to read you all the quotes. I'm just going to read you the top one from our two Rice professors who taught the intro Python class. And they said, I will never, ever, ever teach a class any other way as far as I can tell. This is so much better. I had so much more fun. And the students learned much more. I will never get up here and lecture. I just don't see the point anymore. Now, this is not just good for the instructors. It's also good for students. This is experiments that were done long before Coursera ever came onto the scene. Um, it was done at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who've been flipping the classroom for about a decade. Um, this is uh, an introductory engineering class. And um, what they saw in this class, as well as in others, pretty consistently, is that when you move to this blended learning format, um, you basically move the DFWs, the Ds, the failures, and the withdraws, into the, top, into the passing part of the distribution. And this is consistent across not just Madison experiments, but also experiments that we've heard about in a variety of other settings. So I'm going to just, um, so now I'm going to wrap up with some high level thoughts of where this is going next. So the first comment is one that is an observation not due to me, due to one of our instructors, Christian Turwish, also from Wharton, um, who basically pointed out that education is by nature a trade-off along a Pareto optimal curve um, between faculty productivity, the number of students that you can teach in an hour, and the learning outcomes that you obtain. Large lecture hall, 700 people, great productivity, very mediocre learning outcomes. Individual instruction in office hours, great learning outcomes, terrible productivity, completely unscalable. Christian points out that MOOCs basically change the Pareto optimal curve. And it's up to us to decide how to use that. We could use that to take the quality of education that we have in a large lecture hall, mediocre as that might be, and offer it not to 700 students, but to 70,000 students. So you, you might not improve learning outcomes by very much, but you sure as heck increase productivity. Or you can take the amount of time that an instructor spends delivering content, grading assignments, and so on, and instead have her spend that time providing a blended learning experience to her students. So you might not get additional scalability, but you get better learning outcomes. And so this is a continuum, and it's up to us to decide how we want to use this in the context of the population that we're trying to serve and what it is that we're trying to achieve with them. So the last piece of this is I just want to take a step back and think about the population that's being reached primarily by these MOOCs right now. There's been a lot of hyperbole in the media, positive and negative, depending on whose perspective you have, on how this is going to be the death of universities. It isn't. Um, I think it's going to enhance universities in the way that we just saw. The primary audience of MOOCs in their open access format is actually people who are not currently and will never be in an educational environment. And that falls into two primary populations. The first of those are what you might call lifelong learners. About 80% of our students actually have degrees at this point. Partly it's because they're early adopters. Partly it's because a lot of the courses have been graduate courses. But partly it's because there's a hunger in people who have finished their college degree 15 years ago and realized that the, um, that the uh, jobs that they learned how to perform in school no longer exist for having access to a new educational experience that keeps them vibrant, keeps them reskilled. And so I think this is a real opportunity for all of us to embed education much more deeply into the fabric of our lives rather than having it end when you graduate from whatever your ultimate degree is at the age of 25. The um, second type of population, and this is coming back to Tom Friedman again. Tom Friedman was one of the first people to write up about this effort back in May of 2012, right after we launched. And Tom has a pretty impressive way with words. And what he said was the big breakthroughs are what happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. So let me talk about desperately necessary. India wants to increase post-secondary completion from 13 to 30%. 30% puts them in line with OECD countries. Um, in order for India to achieve that, they would have to build 1,500 academic institutions. Now, even if you ignore the somewhat daunting logistics of building 1,500 campuses in India, the current campuses in India are suffering even the best ones 
because of lack of qualified instructors. So you build these campuses, well, who's going to staff them? This is not a problem that one can solve within a generation because you cannot create human capital that quickly. And so if we want to provide an educational experience to all of those people within their lifetime, there has to be a different solution than building physical campuses. And so technology provides us with one path forward because today only 30% of our students are in the United States and 40% are in the developing world including countries not just like India and Russia, not just the BRIC countries, but also Nigeria, South Africa, um, and even Bangladesh. And so I think there is a real opportunity for us to open doors to education to a much, much larger population and really take education in those countries and turn it from what is inevitably, because of the capacity constraints, a privilege of the few and into a basic human right. Thank you very much. I have been trying to sit here and empathize with Daphne, wondering how I'd feel if I showed up at a university whose provost a couple of days before said they didn't want to be involved in what I was really passionate about. But I want you to know that a lot of us in this audience and at this university are very excited about what you're doing and probably belong on that more positive end of the continuum that Michael Quick described a while ago, that MOOCs are not a four-letter word most of us, they're an opportunity. But I think what a lot of us are trying to decide is an opportunity for what exactly. And I'm sure that's an issue when things start up, they tend to go along and they evolve as they develop. So the questions that I have about MOOCs and particularly about Coursera and maybe Udacity and maybe a couple of others is, if we really are intending that the goal that we share is to help people who are disadvantaged who are poor, who simply don't have access to uh, a higher education, then how do we go about doing that in a way different than universities have done it in the past? Because let's be clear, we have not succeeded at this goal. And when we've tried, we've often set people up for very, very distressing failures. I've seen it happen in a number of universities who've opened their doors to, to poor and disadvantaged students who come in, we're gonna make a place for you Come in, sit down, learn. It's free, only to find people failing in almost universal numbers because those universities weren't set up with the kind of pedagogy that was required to support people that had no background to succeed at a university. And so my concern is, is it possible to do that finally with MOOCs or something like them? Well, everything looks positive. We know, for example, that there's 50 years of research that there is no difference between learning that occurs online and learning that occurs in the classroom. It's either equally disastrous or <laughs> equally beneficial. It doesn't depend on the technology, whether people learn. But what technology does do is to provide access at an extremely reduced cost if we're talking about large numbers. It's, it's extraordinary in those as, as a benefit. What it doesn't do is influence learning one smidgen. There's no learning benefit from technology any more than there is a nutritional benefit from the truck that delivers groceries to a neighborhood, period. All right, so what's the pedagogical consequence of this? I, I wanna start here with whatever questions I might pose to to Daphne at the end of her conversation. If Bloom, 30 years ago, showed us a way to make three sigma increases, two sigma, sorry, two sigma increases in learning, why haven't we done it? Well, we haven't done it in the university. I mean, I don't notice that uh, the pedagogy of, of, of Bloom's taxonomy, Bloom's learning, Bloom's approach to, to learning has actually taken over universities. Faculty are not pedagogical experts, let's be really clear. While some of them are extraordinary teachers, most of us as faculty know a great deal about our specialty areas, we know almost nothing about teaching it. We talk about lectures and discussion and papers and so on, and that's not pedagogy, actually, in any way. 
Those are just different versions of a medium to present something that we haven't done a very good job of presenting. <coughs> so is there a pedagogy? Not just bloom, but Lord, things have happened in 30 years, I hope. At least my tenure in university, I've seen enormous advances in pedagogy that will actually make a difference. So why isn't it being used in the MOOCs? Well, there's an attempt there. Again, going to the, the end of, of Daphne's presentation. But is that, is that attempt, even at scale, represent the best of what's out there? That's actually one of my major questions here, I think, for the, the future of these things. What attempt is being made in the MOOCs to bring in people at a senior level in those organizations who actually know something about research on pedagogy, and who, particularly for disadvantaged and poor people, who can implement it in a way that circumvents the inclination of faculty to always do exactly what they've done in the classroom, no matter what context they're in, except for a few little tweaks here and there that, that are, are, are very interesting. So I'm hoping that there are more people show up in management positions in these MOOCs who actually can develop pedagogy and test it at scale. Think of the opportunity for, for MOOCs as, as uh, pipelines for extraordinary research at scale, the kind of thing we've always wanted to do, those of us who are researchers have never been able to do. Um, how do we discourage the inclination of most faculty who contribute classes from actually contributing what they think of as pedagogy, which hasn't worked or won't work maybe, with the disadvantaged and poor people that we really want to invest in and want to make a difference in. Uh, where are these things? Well, they're there. I mean, there are many people out there, I think, who have the skills to do this and who would be glad to. Uh, but it's not happening so far. I, a friend of mine called the management of most of the MOOCs uh, STEM nerds. It's an unkind term, but most everybody managing MOOCs right now are out of the sciences. They're not out of the social sciences. They're not necessarily out of, the, out of education or out of areas that have spent their whole careers in the last 30 or 40 years studying pedagogy. So there's an opportunity here. The opportunity is to scale the best of what we know and to serve those people that aren't served. And if, if MOOCs can find a way to do that, and still survive financially, because we're talking about what I think of as a wickedly expensive proposition that's not going to continue to be funded by universities, basically, then all more power to you. I genuinely hope that you succeed. Thank you. Should I get the answer? Yes, please. Okay. So we're going to have Daphne respond to Dick's very wonderful comments. Yes. And then uh, those of you who have questions, um, please feel free to come to the mic and um, after she's finished responding and ask your questions. Thank you. Thank you. That is a truly excellent question, and um, I have two answers to it. Um, the first is simply the comment that you're absolutely right, and in fact, one of the current searches that is ongoing at Coursera is one for a director or a vice president of teaching and learning who would bring in exactly the kind of expertise that you're talking about that will allow us to move this technology to the next level. We have interviewed, I think, five or six candidates so far, and um, we hope to conclude this search sometime in the next you know, couple of months and find somebody really amazing who does, was interested in doing the, exactly what you proposed, which is treat this as a unique opportunity for experimentation and education at a scale that has never been seen before and that can teach us um, how people can most effectively learn by trying things out and trying them out in an iterative, rapid uh, improvement cycle that has never been seen in education. So um, along those lines, how many of you know what A-B testing is? Didn't think so. One, two. Um, even if you don't know what A-B testing is, you've, been, you've participated in it. Because every time you go on Google or Facebook or Yahoo or whatever your favorite website is, chances are you're a part of the B group. All those websites have an A group, which is 95% of the population, or 90%, and a B group, which is about 5%. And the B group has a different experience than the A group. And they instrument everything and they track metrics. For example, on Google, it might be click-through rates. 
And if the B group does better than the A group, within a matter of a few days, the entire site shifts over to the B group. And that's what allowed these sites to improve the user experience constantly, week by week, month by month, which is why the Google of today looks nothing like the Google of three years ago. We've never been able to do that in education because the iterative cycles are so slow and the instrumentation and measurements are so painful that you can't have that iterative cycle of improvement, but now you can. So I think this is an amazing opportunity for the right person. The second response to the question is that you look at MOOCs today and you say, yeah, OK, so it's you know, one step better than lecture capture because you modularize the lecture so they're not an hour and 30 minutes of the professor droning. They're only 10 minutes. And there's, you know, there's these in-video quizzes in the middle. And there's some opportunity for mastery and so on. But it's not a significantly different experience than a lecture class. That's true. Um, the analogy that I like to use is the early days of movies. A movie in the very beginning was one of those big, huge cameras on a theater stage filming a theater production. That was a terrible experience because theater actors were acting for the person sitting in row 30 in the, in the theater. And you know, for that, you actually have to overact so that they can even see your facial gestures. You put that on a, you know, close, uh, on, 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 you know, on a close image, it looks terrible. And everybody said, what a terrible experience this is. Why would I do that rather than go watch the theater? Over the course of time, first of all, actors learned to act to the camera rather than act to the theater. So things got better. And then they got much better because people learned to exploit the unique aspects of the medium in ways that were different than the medium of theater. And so now movies and theater are just completely different things. It's not that movies are better than theater or vice versa. They're just different. And that's going to happen to online education, except it's not going to take 60 years to happen, it's going to happen much faster because the whole world is moving faster now. So I would expect that if you come back, if, if, uh, if your provost allows you to invite me again in, in three years, um, the MOOCs that I'll be able to tell you about in three years are going to be totally different than the MOOCs that I told you about today in terms of pedagogy, in terms of how one exploits the medium. And I think it's going to be really cool and exciting. How many of you remember the first cell phones? They were suitcases. You had to carry them. And people said, no one will ever use cell phones because they're so cumbersome and awkward. And, and why, would you, why would anybody want to carry it around unless you're like a business, businessman going on some trip somewhere, right? And now we all carry around our little iPhones or Androids or something. Give it three years, and I think it'll look completely different. And I'm hoping that this director of teaching and learning person that we hope to hire will be able to help us do it. Uh, at Ross here. Oh, he has a mic. Thanks. Uh, my question uh, kind of came at the last slide uh, where it said 30% of uh, MOOC users were in the US. Um, and it's all great and dandy that this is open and it provides some college access. But as a former high school uh, English teacher, I'm wondering how we can scale that back and kind of provide some relief for K 12 educators as well as. Uh, you know, the students, because if you don't have a, a kind of concept of, of college at all, uh, and, you, and your basic concern is, I need to pass my A through G requirements, or I need to learn how to read, uh, the, these courses kind of don't matter. And so how can we kind of use MOOCs to help the, you know, your, your average student that's still kind of at the, the lower rank, ranks of education? It's a great question. Um, so first of all, I already partially answered that question in terms of our teacher training curriculum, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, but I will talk a little bit about the penetration of these courses, not into the you know, primary education, but into secondary education. Because a lot of these courses are um, you know, not the majority, but probably about 30 or 40, what I would call entry level or even pre-college level. So for example, we have a course in remedial writing taught by a faculty member at Mount San Jacinto Community College here in California. 
And she had a tremendous number of people taking these courses who were first generation college goers or not college goers at all, people who had, um, you know, uh, who couldn't write a coherent English sentence, for example, because English was their second language. Um, we have other courses that are, you know, maybe somewhat more advanced, like a, an introductory calculus course, which is, again, not quite, um, maybe not like a remedial course, but still something that leads you into a college experience. And so one of the opportunities that I'm particularly excited about, although I will admit that we have yet to see it manifest, is that this provide a set of resources for high schools that want to provide their students with a college level curriculum that might even end up being college credit bearing in terms of a dual enrollment program. And the reason I'm excited about that is because although there are many programs that provide high school students with college level content, these are primarily um, offered at the better endowed high schools where you have a teacher who is a master's degree in physics who can teach physics, AP physics, to the students. And if you're in an inner city high school or a rural high school in Idaho, you're not going to have such a teacher and you're not going to be able to offer your students that type of curriculum. But the MOOCs are self-contained. And they can be facilitated by maybe a math teacher um, who isn't a physics teacher. And in fact, we have an example of that one of our, some members of our team went to a high school in, in the Bay Area who's that where a group of students are taking the intro Python class um, from Rice University. And the course is being facilitated by a, a math teacher who had never programmed before in his life. And he said he was nevertheless quite capable of working through the material with his students and guiding the discussion and making sure they stayed engaged. And so I think there is an opportunity here to help at least at the high school levels, if not lower down. And so, you know, it doesn't solve the entire problem, but I'm hoping other people are working on other parts. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank you for reminding us that education is about human dignity and compassion and love of learning in a really profound way that was very moving. So, so thank you for that. Um, my question concerns the, you, you commented on the media coverage being quite um, mixed. And I'm just, I wonder if the media doesn't have the language to talk about those aspects of education because they're seeped in the language of human capital and of um, national competitiveness, which your presentation makes clear to us is, is not the primary driver of your work as, as far as I understood it. So I wonder if you could comment a little bit more on your communication strategies as you try to communicate about your work. Uh, you know, I think you're uh, being charitable in terms of your interpretation of why the media coverage has been so hyperbolic. Um, I think it just, it really helps to sell uh, whatever media you're trying to sell if you make a very um, extreme headline in one direction or another. And just like all new technologies that have gathered attention, starts out with people saying this is a stupid idea, then it starts out with people, then it moves to people saying this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and then the next stage is, oh, this was such a terrible idea, it will never ever succeed, and then it evens out into some reasonable intermediate point which is closer to reality. The same thing happened with cell phones, with social networking, with um, you know, pretty much anything else that you can imagine in terms of technological advances. Um, I try not to take it too seriously because I think ultimately the success of this endeavor will not be judged by what the media say about it. It will be judged by what the students that take these courses say about it and by what the employers who hopefully hire these students um, say about the qualifications of the, of the students that emerge from these courses. So it's really about the substance and less about the verbiage to me. Hi. Um, thank you for um, your lecture. But so Coursera has been around for a while and I've taken online courses and much Please. like you have. Two years. I mean, two years is quite a long time considering how many students you reach. If you consider how many hours you put into it, I mean, online gaming itself, you can put forward billions of hours in a month because you have millions of players. And so why Coursera? Why not edX? Why not Uda City? Like, I've taken a class with edX like you, kind of dropped it and was like, I only want to see what it's about. Um, but when I looked at Coursera and I haven't enrolled in the classes, something kind of drew me about it. So kind of what distinguishes you from the other ones? And why, if you were to, to accept um, an online course offering, should that ever happen, why would they choose Coursera over another program? 
So, uh, you know, I think that like every exciting um, direction, it draws uh, a more and more entrance into the field. You mentioned the first and arguably the largest three, but I can reel off probably about 15 others. The UK now has its own MOOC platform called FutureLearn. The French have one called Fun. Germany has Iversity. Uh, Brazil has uh, Viduca. Um, it turns into a matter of national pride to have your own MOOC platform now. Um, and I think it's a question, you know, you're going to get a lot of interest in something that is as exciting and as transformational as this. Um, you know, in terms of this, you know, specifically asked about the differences between us and, um, and edX and, well, first of all, let me say that one of the biggest differences between us and all of these entrants is that we're considerably larger than everybody else. I mean, we're, I think, about five times larger than edX, which is the second largest um, in terms of number of courses, number of universities, number of students. That actually does qualitatively change the experience in some ways. It certainly changes the experience on the faculty side in terms of having a much broader community and a broader range of expertise to draw on in terms of people who've offered classes that are similar to yours from which you can learn. Um, there are other differences in terms of the platform. I don't know how much you want me to get into this. Uh, we have, we actually have a mobile uh, app um, on iOS coming up with iPad soon, Android uh, within the next couple of months. Uh, that's really important for our penetration into the, the developing world where the vast majority of internet access is, going, is happening and continuing to happen via mobile. And so that's the big difference. We, our platform is also internationalized, which others are not. I mean, we can get into platform differences. There's probably a dozen that I could reel off. Some go in this direction, some go in that direction. Uh, I think the single biggest differentiator is the scale. Um, and I think you know it, it, it's going to be interesting to see in, uh, in the course of the coming years whether we're going to end up with a winner-take-all type, um, type of situation which has largely been the case, for example, in the social media like Facebook, although there are isolated pockets of countries that have flipped the other way, um, or is it going to be a more diverse ecosystem? Whatever it turns out to be, the market for education worldwide is enormous, and so there's room for multiple um, entities to be involved in it. Um, thank you very much for uh, your lecture. It's very, very interesting. Um, my question is if Coursera is uh, gathering any data on the, the individuals who do not complete. Outside of different intentions, um, there have been some that say that the online experience is, is different for different learners, and there may be some learners that are better suited for in-classroom learning versus on, uh, online. Are you all gathering any data or have done any analysis about uh, potentially outside of just intention behind completion, why they may be falling off? or? Yeah. Maybe not completing. This is a really excellent question. Um, and I think we could, first of all, I completely agree that the purely online experience uh, might not be appropriate. Sorry, let me rephrase that. The purely online experience is unlikely to be the best one for all learners. There's learners that thrive on it and others that really need that face-to-face -face interaction. We're actually big fans of the blended learning experience, which is why we set up the whole notion of learning hubs and so on and so forth. And I think, and certainly in terms of the those of us who are privileged enough to attend an academic institution, then some amount of, I don't know, I don't know if I want to call it face-to-face -face as much as high touch as you do in, in your online programs here at, um, at USC, um, combined with the more low-touch asynchronous content might be the best one for a lot of students. Now, in terms of gathering information about what makes students more likely to be retained, we have, by and large, the vast majority of the people who intend to complete and don't, as opposed to the people who don't intend to complete and don't, um, is simply because life gets in the way. They're working adults, they have a you know, business trip, a child gets sick, whatever, and they drop behind and they can't catch up. Um, we're looking at different mechanisms now that will allow them to sort of re-inject themselves into the, into the learning process later on, but I think if you had to, to pick the single biggest factor for dropping out, it's that, it's just life. Um, there are other things that we're doing, like I said, to try and make that experience more engaging and like social and gamification that I mentioned and so on and so forth. And I think it's an ongoing process for us to see how much of that retention, um, you know, say the, this, how much of the 64% can we raise up to 100% to for the people who actually come in with an intent to complete. 
Thank you for your lecture. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was wondering if Coursera currently or plans to group courses into a cumulative uh, earning certificate, and if that's complicated by having courses from multiple institutions. Oh, I, I, I can't believe that slide got dropped. Thank you for reminding me. Um, uh, three weeks ago, we launched this thing called specializations. Um, specializations are multi-course curricular sequences, typically but not always from a single institution. Uh, so we have a data analysis one from Johns Hopkins. We have one in learning how to think and argue from Duke University. Uh, one on governance that's a two university initiative from G University of Geneva and Leiden and eight course sequence from the Commonwealth Education Trust on learning how to teach and so on. Um, what's interesting about these, there's 10 of them and there will be more. What's interesting about them is that in addition to the actual coursework, there's also a capstone project at the end. So students who successfully complete every single course in the sequence are eligible then to participate in a closed class just for the successful completers that has them doing an open-ended project that is evaluated via peer grading. Now the nice thing about peer grading in this context is the students who are in that class are really, really good. They have completed, say, five challenging classes, so they're both motivated and knowledgeable, and so peer grading is going to be a much higher quality experience than just peer grading in a regular old course. And so I think this is something that's been very popular. The first couple of specializations that have launched have gotten enormous numbers of enrollments, relatively speaking. We'll have to see how many people persist throughout the entire sequence. Um, but for me, it's a really exciting direction because it provides, in some sense, a lightweight credential for the continuing education learner. It's something that is considerably more substantial than a single course, but considerably less time consuming and difficult to manage than a full, say, master's degree. And so for most working adults, this might be a compromise that fits into their lifestyle. And I think this is going to be a really interesting um, way of providing a continuing education experience to a much, much larger number of people than are currently able to participate in traditional educational offerings. Hi, my name is Constance Elo, and I'm a PhD candidate at USC. Um, thank you for your remarks. Um, you mentioned scalability a lot, and so I was just wondering if there are any parts of um, the educational experience, or even the Coursera educational experience, that you think might diminish or lose value as you scale up, and in what ways do you work to try to maintain the value when you do attempt to scale up? I'm not worried about the value um, in the sense that this is high quality, really high quality content from some of the world's best scholars. And if you offer it to 100,000 people or to a million people, I think the value is still there. Um, I am concerned about the ability to scale certain kinds of experiences in an effective way. So with peer grading, we've done a lot more than we expected to be able to do in a scalable way. And, and the experiment that I described with a Georgia Tech physics class is yet another case where I would not have expected a scalable solution, and yet one emerged. But there's places that I currently don't see a path to a scalable solution. For example, I mentioned the difficulty of grading in depth a 10,000 word critical essay, for example. I just don't see peer grading at the moment being able to you know, give that level of in-depth critique that you get from a, an expert instructor. So I think there's going to be limitations to scale, things that we currently don't know how to handle. And so it might not get us to every single course that can be offered on a university campus can also be offered in this scalable format. But so be it. If we get 90% of the way there, I, th I think that's still pretty amazing. Join me in thanking Daphne.